So why are we all here and why do we have Christmas hats on in a room at Zoom video conferencing? Okay, so, so I've been a venture capitalist in Silicon Valley since 1991, so almost 30 years. I funded around 150 companies. I've had 22 of them go public. And I often wish that I had recorded some of the early moments at any number of those companies, and I never did. But here we are today with two of the companies I've backed that have been big hits. Hiro Yoshikawa founded Treasure Data. Eric Yuan has founded Zoom. And we're just going to touch on some interesting stories, both of, you know, successes and also some tough moments because we had <laughs> lots. Look at those smiles. Right. <laughs> Look at those smiles. We have all had very tough moments. So that's kind of why we're here. Quick introduction. So um, Hiro Yoshikawa is the founder of Treasure Data. It's a, a, a big data company that today is doing, is it 7 trillion rows of data a month or uh, more? Probably it's, more. <laughs> yeah, more now. So it's just like grown like crazy. It's basically functioning as an iCloud for billions and billions and billions of microprocessors coming out of ARM Corporation, part of SoftBank now, uh, to help people kind of manage all that stuff and manage the data around them. And uh, Zoom video conferencing is by far the world's leader in video communications of all kinds. It's a recently public company that's worth about, it floats between 20 and $30 billion. So it's, it's quite also, actually, it's a quite much bigger hit than <laughs> Carter Data, but they're both good companies. So let, let's start with Hero because there's a little bit of an intersection here because sure. both Eric and I were seed investors yes. in Treasure Data. Yes. So let's hear that story of how that came together. Sure. Um, okay, so I came to the States in the Valley in the 2009 uh, as a part of the, the Intel company transfer when I was working for a Japanese company called Mitsui. Um, I came here in the 2009, uh, but as you, you guys remember, it was a horrible year, right? <laughs> Nothing really happened uh, in in the valley. A bunch of companies are going, you know, went out of the business, and venture funds themselves get got out of the business. But there are only two, I'd say, like a big trend uh, still survived in that horrible moment. One is a clean tech, like uh, solar technologies, battery technologies, and such. And the other one is big data. And then the, because of my background, I spent you know the years at Red Hat initially as operating operating system engineer, Linux engineer, uh, and I was enthusiast. I was enthusiastic about the other platform operating system, middleware, and the database technologies. And also, I was really very big believer in the open source as well. Mm -hmm. So, like you know, I kind of started thinking about starting something about. The, the big data slash Hadoop movement. And then the, I was lucky enough to get to know two, my co, two of my co-founders, Sada Furuhashi and Kazota. And then I decided to brought them uh, from Japan uh, to the Valley to start a company. And uh, I think it was January 2011 when I started talking to investors. I think I met with 15 angel seed investors. Nobody cared about us. <laughs> you said before, Bill. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, the, uh, seriously, the, for the first six, seven you know, weeks of my fundraising, I mean, like, nobody really listens to us, right? I mean, like, uh, I even didn't really show up my de pitch deck. Like, you know, the, just shake hand, grab coffee, chat it for five, you know, five minutes, and then I was just set, good luck, <laughs> right? But I was very lucky enough to uh, get to know Bill uh, through our mutual friend, Mario Kurosaki, and you know Mario too, yep. Eric. Um, and then when I got a call from Mario, I was having a coffee uh, with uh, my co-founder, uh, CTO, Akaz, in Mountain View, and then when I was, when Morio said like, hey, Bill is you know, willing to meet you guys. I was so nervous because Bill was already a big guy <laughs> in the Thunder Hill. Everybody knew Bill, right? I was like, oh my gosh. Uh, but like, you know, uh, but you know, I, I met uh, with Bill uh, at the CRV office then, yep. you know, in Thunder Hill. He really listens to us very carefully. Uh, and then in the first, you know, 
in the after probably 15, 20 minutes passed, you know, the, since I started the pitch, he committed. And he wrote a check, physical check to me. <laughs> I still use a checkbook, yes. <laughs> I thought I thought it would give him a cash. <laughs> oh, check. Yeah. I could have given like, him a Bitcoin. I was <laughs> like, you know, of course I was so happy, but before them I was like stunned. Oh my <laughs> gosh, yeah. this is money. You know. Well, I, I should tell you what was happening in background. Okay, so so this gentleman Morio Kurosaki, yeah. who I also introduced to Eric and he wrote a check for Zoom. Yeah, so years ago I had founded a uh, around an open source site called zebra.org a Linux protocol company that had routing protocols. So we basically could do everything mm -hmm. Cisco could do with Linux yep, yep. applications. And I took the two engineers out of there. Morio wrote me a check as chairman of this company. And, and one day he called me up and he said, hey, Bill, I met this kid. He reminds me of your CTO <laughs> from that, like, I, that Linux company, but he works on this thing called Hadoop. <laughs> hey, can you tell me if it's important? I don't know what Hadoop <laughs> is. I was like, Hadoop? He works on Hadoop? And so I had funded a bunch of these companies that were essentially one-person companies at their start, TweetDeck, Voxer, Tango, which Eric funded with me. And these companies were all taking off, Wish, and they were all looking for Hadoop engineers. And they were all competing to hire the same same people. Exactly. So I thought, a Hadoop engineer? What does he do? And Morio said, well, I think he founded like the world's largest Hadoop user group, but it's in Japan. I said, well, fly him over. I want to meet him. <laughs> and so as soon as I met him and he showed, showed me that you guys could build a Hadoop yeah, cluster, yeah. I was in. That's how that, that's yeah. why it moves so fast. Yeah, yeah. And then since then, like, you know, the, the power of Bill is not just head check back. Rather, it's his network itself. Like, you know, he, you know, since the day he committed, he started, uh, you know, introducing a bunch of like a great, in, you know, the angel investors, uh, the seed investors. Actually, that include yourself, Eric. Uh, you know, Jerry Ann, the Yahoo founder, Dan Scheinman, uh, the another board member of Zoom. <laughs> like, a lot of great engineers got together to really support us. That, oh, we that, had a rock star. I mean, we had Othman Laraki, the yeah, VP Othman. of Growth, Revenue Engagement at Twitter, yep. the three founders of Heroku, the yep. CTO of Mint, yep. uh, the CIO of Informatica. Yep. Yeah, it was a, it was a great yeah, super start. Star, yeah, superstar group of the, the NGO investors. That was the genesis of Treasure Data. Well, you know, part of the reason we did that was because I knew we didn't know what we were going to do. <laughs> <laughs> so I needed an investor group that could help us figure out what to do. And in fact, two of our earliest customers were our investors. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so the uh, we also got Peter and Danny, who were the co-founders of Wish.com, to yeah. put a little bit of money in, and Eric from Zoom, and both of those became early users that helped yeah, us customers. figure out what to build. Yep. Yeah. And Wish went on to become our first real customer, our first paying customer. Exactly, in the U.S., yes. They're a very big customer yeah. of us. Yeah, they're, they're yeah. quite big. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and Zoom also was an early user. You know, it's, uh, it's, and Zoom also, is kind of yeah. outgrown us a bit, but, you know, <laughs> but it's been great. Yeah, and, and Eric, why don't we talk, we're going to talk a little bit about failure points too. But sure. Love to hear Eric's story, and then how, mm -hmm. how did you decide to start what became Zoom? Sure, sure. My story is very similar to Hiro-san's. I, I, I came to here a little bit earlier. I came to the Valley in 1997, joined WebEx as one of the first several founding engineers. Ultimately, I became vice president of engineering, and the company was very lucky. We went public uh, year 2000, and then the company was sold to Cisco 2007. And after that, I was at Cisco for several years, and as uh, Cisco's corporate vice president, in charge of collaboration. Well, and by the way, si when it went public, what was it worth, and what did Cisco pay for it? Oh, Webex uh, went public in July year two thousand. I think around five hundred, you know, less than six hundred million. And by twenty uh, uh, two thousand seven. And the company was sold to Cisco, which was a uh, $3.2 billion cash deal. Yeah, that's 2007. And I was there for another four and a half years in charge of collaboration software development. And the year before I left, every time I talked with a web as customer, I did not see a single happy customer. You know, I was so embarrassed. I tried to understand what had happened. Finally realized the problem is customer shared with me were the brand new problems. We never thought about that, like a video quality, you know, multi, you know, the the screen uh, sharing, like uh, for mobile, the mobile experience, the cloud-based video uh, conference solution, 
How can you guarantee the quality, no matter where the attendee coming from, from other countries? We never thought about that when we built WebEx. So the only way to fix those problems is to build a new solution from the ground up. And Cisco was unwilling to change its collaboration strategy. It took me one year. I failed to convince you know, others to rebuild the solution. And that's why I decided to leave, along with some top WebEx engineers. However, after I left, I thought, you know, I was part of uh, WebEx uh, success story. I tried to build a new solution. For sure, I talked to VC. They all will invest, right? I was very wrong. <laughs> and I found two things looking back. One thing, whoever I talked with, I mean the VCs, they did not invest. For all those uh, Android investors I know before, and I sent them a slide deck, whoever opened my PowerPoint slide deck, they also did not invest. Only those friends or Android investors who never opened up my PowerPoint pitch deck, they just trust me. You see, Eric, I even do not know what you're doing. I know you did not even, <laughs> even yeah, so you send me the PowerPoint slide deck, right? Yeah, it's just like yes. coffee. You are the first one who committed, I think. Bill, I'm going to build the next generation of collaboration solution, a much better one than WebEx, focus on video. Are you willing to invest? You know, I remember this. For sure, I will. And yep. he's the first one <laughs> who committed. He even did not ask about, you know, what kind of a solution I want to build, why we, I think we can build a much better solution. And I do not think you you even requested about the pitch deck, right? I never the looked PowerPoint. at one exactly. until after the company started. <laughs> yeah. So what so, made you well, okay, totally so, believe in him? Well, actually, so there are several confluences here too. So Eric and I were both investor, angel investors in Tango Video, which had exploded out of nowhere to be the number one or number two app in the iPhone store. And I knew that there was a structural change happening in the market. And I could also tell that, that video was going to be lower cost, higher quality, more pervasive. And I think Eric didn't know this at the time, but now you know because you know, we were I was here last week talking about some products. And uh, he remembers a product that I came up with in 1994 called the Video Blaster. So a friend of mine from LSI Logic had gone on to start uh, a chip unit at Chips and Technologies that was a PC uh, analog pass-through for video on, so you could have video. Like in the, in the early 90s, PCs only beeped at you. They didn't have audio. So I funded a company called Creative Labs that had the sound card, and we cooked up a product to have video. And then I went on to fund 8x8 that had video compression chips and some other things. So I'd, I'd have a, I'd had a long history. And here I had the expert who was on the Tango video advisory board as an advisor on video quality. And it, it just it just felt right. I just I just felt like there was a sea change, a special guy. And I could I could have predicted the venture capitalist reaction. Mm-hmm. And in fact, after we seed funded Eric, I would show it to other venture firms. Same thing. They they wouldn't get it because they're like, well, isn't isn't Hangouts free from Google? And isn't didn't Skype just get acquired by by Microsoft and it's free and you know, and Blue Jeans has raised $120 million and it's dying. I don't know if they're dead yet. No, they're still alive. But anyway, so, <laughs> so, that, but anyway, so, so keep yeah, going. So, yeah. so, yeah, he raised yeah, the that's a story. Yeah, I think uh, Bill is, uh, is not only a great friend, but I really understand what's going on in the market. I think, uh, your, your, I think either your intuition or my expertise, I, you know, first one, I just within the 15 minutes, you know, I think uh, he already committed. That's pretty simple. How did you feel after getting denied from the venture capital firms? I feel great, seriously, back then, because I, you know, I'm not a guy who is uh, easy to give up on anything. If you told me something wrong or something not right, I will prove you are wrong. <laughs> so looking back, like seriously, it. that's one of the reasons we were working so hard day and night. I would say, yeah, you do not think we can build something, you know, better than the the, the other solutions. I would tell you, you are wrong in the future. I think that's one of the I would see the the reasons why you know very resilient. Yeah. Both of these guys are very resilient. So what about you? What what was one time where you felt like? Yeah, first of all, like in from the beginning, right? Nobody really listens to me. <laughs> 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 oh my gosh! Like you know, the, the, I was nobody in the valley, seriously. And then the, the, myself and the co-founders just came out from Tokyo of Japan, right? I thought like you know we were confident enough to really build the right product. And then I was, we were very confident that like we could make our customers happy, but nobody really cared. Yeah. So lesson learned, sometimes you got to listen to others. Sometimes you just, uh, you know, pursue your own dream. 
Don't listen to others. Now that said, both of you guys, I know <laughs> there isn't a company I funded that hit or didn't hit that didn't have like life-threatening moments where they thought, oh my God, I think <laughs> I'm dead. You know, so I'd love to hear both of you guys. So let's start with you here. So, sure. So what's I like- I think I can, you know, the, the, it's interesting. Like, you know, the, the, uh, f- looking back the, my like eight, 80 years memory as a CEO of Treasure Data, overall, it was beautiful memory. But when I think of each independent like event, right? It's they're all bad, bad events. <laughs> but like, it's kind of interesting. But like, you know, two like two, I had to say for me, catastrophic events. One is that like early days of uh, the treasure data, we relied a lot on uh, the online gaming industries because it was when the Z- Zynga and many other online gaming companies. Uh, became very big boom, right? And then they knew how t- they knew how to really use like a data, basically convert the data into money, right? So we had a very very good first two or three years um, by working with uh, gaming companies, but online gaming bubble crashed, and then like you know the, a lot of companies started leaving us, and then. The, by for the largest online, co- you know, online gaming companies that we worked with, they also got churned out. Not because of our product quality, they're very happy about Treasure Data, but because of the business, they needed to leave us. It was a shocking moment. It was right before Series A, um, so I was so nervous about like, you know, the, how to really recover uh, the, the growth. Um, and the second one is, you know, unfortunately, this is completely uncontrollable thing. But right before, actually, right after I started the Series B process, um, the market got crushed. Sorry, the Series C process, which is in Q1 2016, the market got crushed, especially the SaaS slash data market. For example, Tableau's stock got hammered by almost 50%. And many other, like as enterprise SaaS and the data companies lost the, the market cap big time. And right before them, I already nailed, I already got uh, three term sheet, I guess, two or three term sheet, including a verbal commitment. They're all gone. I was like, oh my gosh, I couldn't really share this with anybody. <laughs> I remember that yeah, period. Yeah. So like, you know, that it, it was only Bill whom I could call. And I gave a call to Bill, and <laughs> I almost shouted, hey, Bill, like, we're done. <laughs> but like, uh, like yes, like uh, we could find another investors um, in Asia who could really help us uh, to <laughs> basically help us survive for the series, uh, series C process. But those are the two catastrophic, devastating moments. Funny, I've, I've been chairman <laughs> since the founding and I don't even, you know, I remember the moment, but I don't remember any pain, you know, because those things just kind of like go in one ear, out the other. It's like, hey, we just got to keep going, you know, which is what Eric is like. But there have to have been moments. And I never talked to Eric about like the hard times, but I know the beginning was like rough to get investors, yeah. but I don't know if you had any moments where you thought the company was in jeopardy. I think it's still back to the early stage, right? Remember, we, uh, I think, yes, we we got three million uh, uh, seed money, yep. right? For the, you know. The angels, the, yep. yeah. Angels. And, you know, we have so many engineers. And uh, before the product w- was ready, for sure, we needed to raise a Series A. You know, similar thing happening. Yeah, right? yeah. You know, we still do not invest, we're still private because we product still not ready. What can we do? And we talk with uh, still the same group of early investors, you know, and uh, uh, also talk to two more, like, uh, you know, Qualcomm Venture and Jerry yeah. as well. Those two joined. Jerry Yang, yeah. Jerry Yang and Qualcomm Ventures. Those two joined the early investor group. And to finally we close the Series A. Yeah. You know, otherwise, you know, we sort of uh, we were stuck. A similar story into yours. You know, it's really hard to find the money for Series A because we are product sort of uh, was in alpha. You know, even before alpha, we really needed several more millions, right, to get us to get there. But uh, you know, without the, the the commitment from early investors with Jerry, I think really, I guess probably we're already done. So 
That's what I've heard. Well, I remember that time because yeah. I think uh, we, we after the IPO, a bunch of us got together with Jerry for a little dinner uh, yeah, after the wonder, IPO. Yeah, wonderful dinner. Yes, and and uh, w- one of the guys that worked with Jerry, Nick Adams, dug up a slide yeah. deck from that period, nice. and I, you know, that's such a long distant memory. None of us, I didn't remember. Yeah, even, yeah, I, yeah. I often didn't look at the slide deck, so I may not have seen it. But they they went through the slide deck, and at that time, I think there were sixty thousand cumulative users. Or yeah. downloads or something like that, yeah. which uh, to those in the audience, I don't know if like 60,000 sounds like a lot or not, but it's nothing, right? Because, you know, a lot of these companies in web world now, when you get an app that hits, you get 100,000 users a day. And this was a company that had 60,000 downloads over a year and a half or two yeah. <laughs> and maybe 20,000 uh, actives or something yeah, less like than that. that. Less than that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, so nobody was looking. The like, people that saw the numbers, like, whoa, this market is crowded, and this one has nothing going on. But, uh, but yeah. But we we lobbied Jerry and Qualcomm, and they came through. It was amazing. Yeah. Also, not a lesson learned, especially you look at it from an investment perspective. Quite often, you know, you know, you have so many investors. If you really invest into the business, or invest into the founder or founding team, that's a big difference. If you, anyone who tried to invest our business, guaranteed, you know, I'm also not going to invest either. Right? <laughs> <laughs> if you want to invest in the funding team, invest in the funders, you know, right, they are going to figure out a way to survive. Right? I think that's a way, right? Otherwise, you know, so this is a great story, you know, for both of us, right? Yeah. You know. What is the correlation? I mean, it sounds like resilience is the one big thing that you guys have found. Is that no matter what, and you seem to find the right people <laughs> that will go through any problems. Do you guys work together with uh, your businesses? You know, how do you want to talk about that? Yeah. How you guys met yeah. each other? Um, the, from Treasure Data's perspective, I think Treasure Data is one of, one of um, the first groups of the Zoom commercial yes. uh, customers. The paid customers. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> You're welcome. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. You know, the, the by design, um, the Treasure Data, uh, from day one, Treasure Data was a global international company, right? Like, we have a lot of engineers uh, in Asia, pretty much like a Zoom. Yep. You know, most of our core engineer, engineers are located in Tokyo, and some in Seoul, and now we have uh, people in Canada, Europe. Real-time communication is a key. And then, yeah, we, we used to rely a lot on Skype or like, you know, text or exchanging text. But obviously, Zoom really, really changed the destiny of our You know, I, I got to say, as a venture person, so I started here in the 80s when startups were kind of big, heavy iron, you know, like silicon systems. And you'd have to have like a couple hundred people in the same building working on the same thing. The world has totally changed, Mm -hmm. and I think part of it is enabled by Zoom because the vast majority of the companies that I fund today are not a lot of people in one place. They're distributed organizations. Fully distributed. Fully distributed, and I think, you know, as as I look at the startup of Treasure Data, uh, and we're we're also going to do a segment with Wish a little later because they they Mm -hmm. couldn't make it today, but um, uh, when we funded Treasure Data, the CEOs of Wish and Zoom came in with a bunch of other people. All of the companies were multinational from the beginning. So Zoom was China and the USA. Uh, Wish was China and the USA. Treasure Data was Japan and the USA. And it was really amazing. We would not have been able to build, Wish, by the way, is worth $11 billion today. We would not have been able to build any of those companies in the way we did without Zoom. And Wish wouldn't exist the way it does today without Treasure Data. And you know, there's a saying in venture capital that you never, ever, ever take startup on startup risk, <laughs> right? Because, you know, if but you're- you that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but if you've got a company that's got like a 1% chance of succeeding and 99% chance of failing, and you multiply the 99% chance of failing times another 99% times another 99%, you got nothing. But anyway, we had all three of these companies working together in the beginning, and they all lived, and they're yeah. now worth like $40 billion together. Yeah. It's like kind of mind blowing. Anyway. Very healthy ecosystem. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I really like the group of companies. Do you want to talk more about startup risks? I know that's one of the big points. Yeah. Here. So you know, I guess uh, so when you were asking, like, what do you what do you bet on? I think you know, um, I was very very lucky early in my career. So when I came out to the valley, I joined a startup called LSI Logic, 
And most people don't know that company, but the uh, some people have heard of Fairchild Semiconductor, which is kind of the granddaddy of all the, the companies out here in the Valley. Like Kleiner Perkins and Sequoia both came out of Fairchild effectively. So did Intel and National AMD. The head of sales was named, of National Semiconductor was named Don Valentine. And Don funded, uh, the, so the CEO of Fairchild left, started LSI Logic. His backers were Don Valentine, who started Sequoia, Tom Perkins, that started Kleiner Perkins, and Reed Dennis, that started IVP. And they were on our board. And so I got to observe a little bit from the best, and I later became a partner at IVP. But early in my career, I basically would follow Don Valentine around. And I funded, you know, Microchip and Vitesse and S3, but like like a lot of the uh, silicon. He was such a legendary investor. Yeah, 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 Unfortunately, yeah. just passed away. Yeah, yeah a couple weeks ago. Yeah, Sequoia also as great investor of Zoom as well. So yeah, they led the uh, the one of the bigger D Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but uh, but I remember getting stuck in an airport. We were at a Microchip board meeting, and our flight got canceled. So I was stuck in the airport with Don Valentine in the like 91, 92 time frame. And I was just starting in the business, and I'm like sitting next to him, like, so Don, so like, what do you have to do to be successful in venture capital? What like, what what is it really? What what is it that you do? You know, <laughs> and he said, well, he said it's it's really very simple. He said it's really all about you know markets first, and then people and capital. And he said all you got to do, he says, you, you just have to have a very big market that's well timed, have the right people at the right time. And if you have those, the chances are it's going to work. And if, you know, if it doesn't quite work, you're either in the wrong market or you switch out the people. Mm -hmm. And he said the market has priority. And, it, and he said if, if you have a great market, you can switch people and put in more capital, and eventually it's going to work. If you have a really bad market, you can have the best team in the world and infinite money, and you will lose money every time unless they move. Mm. And so uh, that kind of st has stuck with me forever. So I'm, I'm looking for structural changes in markets where there's an opportunity, like there was in big data or like there was in video, the right catalyst person. And I just try to help, you know, and, and some of it's money, some of it's network. But I think capital takes several forms. There's capital, capital in dollars, but there's other kinds of capital in terms of people and ideas and other relationship assets that matter. One thing I've been thinking about is how the success of your companies has changed your day-to-day -day work life and personal life? First of all, I don't think our company is successful because, uh, you know, it's an ongoing, you know, effort, right? You know, to be a public company, just a small milestone. You got to learn from our other big companies, right? So it's keep going. Really, we, we never mentioned we are successful. We just started, literally. I think that's why I think, uh, you know, uh, from over the past 80 years, even today, I think uh, by and large, you know, I think uh, very little has changed. We keep, working, we keep working as hard as we can, do all we can to make sure the customer happy. For me, really care about the employees. I really, really want to win. You know, more like a game, right? So, you know, you know like play this season, you are, win, you are going to win the champion. Guess what? You're going to start the next season very soon, right? Every game is different. That's uh, similar to sports, right? And uh, we just cannot stay on the past, you know, small, you know, uh, uh, success. We got to move forward. And uh, pers on personal front, I think also where little has changed. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much, yeah. You know, it's mind blowing that this company only has 1,700, is it 1,700? No, 2,300. Oh, it grows every time I come. <laughs> <laughs> it grew, it grew it by in an hour, Bill. <laughs> yeah, it's growing every hour. But still, you know, for a company that, you know, and I know, uh, I don't remember exact uh, estimates from the street because, you know, you can never, uh, you never really know because the analysts push the reports, but I think the company's over 100 million a quarter or has been anyway. And it's growing around, you know, 70, 80% year over year, roughly, at something like 80% gross margins, which is mind blowing. You know, I think I have to say of all the companies I funded, I've never seen a company that has this kind of a margin structure. You know, if you think about year over year growth on a 100 million ish base, growing like, you know, 80% ish a year or something like that, that means that there's like 60 million of gross margin new every quarter ish you know it's approximate numbers because i'm not a wall street analyst anymore mm -hmm. but but it's it's mind-blowing the leverage that this company has been able to create in the SaaS market which by itself was one of the better categories already you know in the big data category i think you know zoom uh, sorry uh, treasure data 
uh, with the CDP products, it's yeah. 80% year over year growth or what uh, is Yes, you know, 80 per, around 80% to That's 100. Yeah. yeah, also it's 70%-ish. Yeah, 70%, margins. yeah. 70 yeah, we sold too early, man. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> well, see, like this is like your, Eric had WebEx, you have this one. <laughs> so, All right. so we gotta wait for you to come out. Do your next, next one. Next, next one. one. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why I keep going, right? It's in Silicon Valley, right? Either you start a company or join a company. Otherwise, what can you do, right? You know, if you if you retire, you know, you 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 are you are going to lose. Uh, I would say the the dream, right? To to make the world a much better place. Everybody wants to build something and try to contribute, right? That's the reason why you know this is a culture of Silicon Valley. Yes, so. and it's cool. And Zoom set aside some shares for a. Uh, um, Sustainability or for a Im good, good impact, right? Yeah, Zoom fund because you know we are in our company value is care. Right? Number one thing is to care about the community, right? Look at the San, San Jose, right? So many homeless people, right? What we can do, every company, every entrepreneur, we got to think about the big picture. We all need to think about how to help others, how to contribute back to the community, society. Look at the you know sitting about the housing crisis, you know homeless people. I think if all the company work together, private sector, public sector together, I think we can really make sure the Silicon Valley a much better place. California much better. Much and better Zoom, place. I forgot how much did Zoom set aside? It's uh, uh, five hundred thousand shares. Five hundred thousand shares. Wow. Wow. Essentially, yeah. like uh, see, like around the, you know, f you know, thirty-five. 35, 40 mini. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I know for a fact the traffic was less because a lot of people were working from home on Zoom. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Of course, this is great for the climate change, right? Great it's for kind of, of course. Course. Great. You know, the carbon emission, and if you use Zoom more, and for sure you also you are going to contribute back, right, to the, the community. So. In a more family time. Exactly. Right. For more family time, you know, save the, in the carbon emission, and this is always is good, yeah. You want to talk about anything in your life that sort of changed, and what what's a what is a day in the life? So unlike unlike Zoom, uh, Treasure Data was acquired by a SoftBank Group arm. So like you know, technically I'm no longer CEO. Okay. Right? So you know, from that perspective, my day has been changed big time. Of course, like I'm still uh, the responsible for the entire Treasure Data business, and the team has grown by almost three folds, three x. What, how many people now? Almost 500, including all the kind of corporate functions, yeah. I think, um, since we got sold, we got bought by ARM. Um, but at the end of the day, the core mission of Treasure Data has not been changed at all. We always have to keep our customers happy, right? Uh, without customers happy, we can succeed. The money doesn't matter at all, right? You know, the, the, it's, it's all about how our product, how our technologies can help companies, how, you know, to help society to do something better, yep. right? It's all about it. Yeah, from that perspective, I can, I can comfortably say that my day, my mission has not been changed. Except Have your hours changed? <laughs> <laughs> I want to know that because you know being around the company mostly during its private era, and and I know as a private company CEO, yeah. the hours don't really matter because it's it literally twenty four by seven. Yeah. Like you know, and and I think people have a misimpression, by the way, that once a company gets to a certain size, that eventually it gets big enough that it's on cruise control. Mm -hmm. But I think what happens is you 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 go from having like a little motorcycle that can cruise to driving a semi trailer uh, yeah. on a windy mm -hmm. road. Yep. And it's just the problems are bigger, and they're they're of more scale, and course correcting gets harder. Yeah. You know, so you never really are able to sleep when you're the CEO, <laughs> or you're yeah. think you're you're solving the problems. Not thinking in your every minute. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, but well, is that true one, for you anymore? Yeah, yeah, of course. Well, like you know, yeah. I mean, the the to be fair, you know, Arm SoftBank Group are very good companies uh, to work for, uh, but ultimately, you know that. I don't really have the the one hundred percent of the control in the organization, of course. So that you know, obviously, like you know, wearing off the hat of CEO, like you know, I could probably offload some, you know, anxieties. But at the same time, like I also have to add some more on my plate. New anxiety, <laughs> just like like you had at WebEx, <laughs> right? You pick up a different set of anxieties, <laughs> but but at least you can let go and go to sleep. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, what yeah. was one of the biggest problems you had with Zoom? 
that you guys had to work on to like a near death moment other than funding? I mean, it could be it, near death other than funding or just something that you constantly felt like this is really, we've been working on this for months and we can't figure it out. And then you finally did or still working I on it. I don't think we have that moment. Mm -hmm. I think that because when we started, we have a clear vision and we have very well defined culture and a company value, which is every day just to focus on our value. It's just to, you know, remind us of where we are coming from, right? Stay humble, keep working hard. I think, yeah, we, yeah, that's still pretty much from day one until today, yeah. Meaning we are very paranoid. So before something bad, big happens, you know, we already, you know, get some clue, right? We, we want to fix those problems, you know, before something hit hard to us. What's the future look like for Zoom? I mean, I, I would love to have feel like we were all virtually here. We didn't even have to drive in for the podcast. Exactly. In the future, you know, you are sitting at home. I'm sitting here. We can have this podcast. I, I, you know, shake, shake hands with you. In the future, <laughs> in the future, <laughs> you feel like, you know, that's you can feel that intimacy. Oh, nice. In the future. Really? Yeah, exactly. You know, it's a plus. Also, not only do we support that, but also support a real-time language. Translation very wow, accurate, that's right? Cool. You speak Japanese, you speak a different language. We understand each other very well. You really do not need to learn a foreign language. You know, speak one language. You know, artificial intelligence, AI, they can translate in real time, very accurate, right? And plus, you know, no matter how long the meeting is, automatically generate a meeting summary. You know, I know you are drinking a coffee remotely. I can enjoy the smell. You see, with a Zoom in the future, no distance barrier, no language barrier. No culture barrier. How, the how close is, is that future? The future is uh, 10 years out, maybe. I mean, 15, 15 you years. You know, that haptic handshake is, is almost there. I mean, it's it's not production worthy, but a friend of mine. Early uh, prototype, I guess. Yeah, have you yeah. seen it yet? No, not yet. I can show you. Yeah, one. please. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Make a connection. That's our vision. Yeah. yeah. I, 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 I like know Google Translate, at least, is That's getting close. Pretty, pretty close to instantaneous. No, yeah, still like more than five seconds delay. Okay. I think ideally have a seen ninety nine percent of uh, accuracy and plus no delay. More like this real time, you know, more like a live person, live translator sitting here. I think not there yet. Yeah, it will take several years effort, but we will get there. Yeah. At Treasure Data, I think there was one moment where there was a little bit of a str strategic scare. Mm -hmm. it didn't last very long because I don't I don't scare very easily. But when Amazon entered oh my with Redshift, oh yeah. Yeah, because here we were cooking along at very high margins, and all of a sudden Amazon announces, and you don't really know what the service is until you can actually try it. Yeah. But they announced something that on paper sounded yeah, like ours. Yeah. Uh, I think I think like um, the very first the Treasure did its tagline when I used uh, when we launched, and uh, you guys joined the party, right? Launch party. Like we, the our very first tagline was. Cloud data warehouse. Yep. I thought like it was a very big hit, but it could only last for three, four months. <laughs> Amazon announced Redshift took everything. <laughs> and then they now like it and say like a cloud data warehouse, Amazon Redshift. I was, yeah, devastated. <laughs> And then uh, we have no way to really compete against a company like, you know, the spending billions, you know, tens of billions of uh, R&D cost. That really... And we were built on top of Amazon oh, yeah. to boot. <laughs> That's right. So I was like, holy shit. Risk on risk. Yes, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. So like, you know, but of course, like, you know, the, you, you have, you have two, two choices, right? To keep competing against them or find a new niche or a beachhead to really own the 100% of the market share we ended up deciding to not really pivot, but to focus on some very specific market, which ended, ended up being our current focus market, which is called a customer you know, data platform, CDP market. Great. Well, and I think the other thing that both companies are doing now, uh, kind of, a little bit of open source, and yours isn't pure open source, but I'd say the thing that really helped us at Treasure Data was open sourcing our front end Fluent D. We were the standard ingestion technology underneath the stuff that uploads you into Amazon, into Microsoft Azure. Microsoft, <laughs> Amazon, fine. <laughs> uh, big, Facebook. Big query, <laughs> Facebook, yeah, Google, big query. Yahoo, uh, Comcast, JP Morgan, you know, a bunch yeah, of banks. Yeah, a bunch of them. You know, so, <laughs> so I think we became very pervasive at the front end so that if you were using our technology, 
and you wanted an easy couple of clicks to take that data stream and put mm -hmm. it somewhere, mm -hmm. we were a default. So yep. by saving yep. people a few clicks and making it more convenient, yep. we stayed in the game. Yep. And yep. then Zoom now has a, a really cool developer platform. And, and I think you have for a while, Marketplace. Right? Yeah. Marketplace. Yeah. Yeah, because we always wanted that too. We were going to try to build a marketplace. We yeah, never yeah, got yeah. around to it because, you know, we just ne never had the resources. But I think, you know, being able to have an open API that people can build on top of and then add uh, either build new features or embed Zoom into things. That's kind of the, is that the main yeah, thing? Absolutely. That's a platform play. Yeah. Yeah, there, there. I think I think you're going to see Zoom become more atomic and more granular and more distributed because it, it has that ability in a way that client-based software of the past does not, yep. not easily. You know, because yep. whether it was Skype or uh, yep. and the other services, it would be too hard to keep up with all the variants at the endpoint. Uh, but now I think you know it's all served from the cloud, so it's it's yep. much more straightforward. I don't know. Is there anything else that you guys want to? Uh what, what about Christmas plans? What are, what are your Christmas plans? I have fun. I'm fine. Say, have fun. Are you guys, <laughs> guys going to go anywhere this year? No, I think <laughs> yeah. I stay at home. I mean, in case, uh, you know, my, my son just, uh, you know, uh, he's going to come back, right? You know, to, Star the, basketball yeah, player. Yeah, you oh, know, yeah. So, you know, he's already freshman in college, right? You know, I think a family gets it together. I think uh, that's the best, right? And because, uh, you know, every day is so busy. And finally, they get a whole entire family together. Yeah. Oh, nice. It's, this is the best it's part. It's very special. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very they're special. not going to zoom in for Christmas? <laughs> <laughs> no, no zoom. Not, not already, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Eventually, they'll zoom the whole family to other places together. In the future. Oh, yeah. Yeah. In the future. Yeah. What about you? Yeah, I have three small kids, eight, uh, four, and two-year-old. So, time. yeah. So Special uh, time, nice yeah. time. Yeah, I'm going to enjoy my off with those kids. And then yeah. I'll, we're going to bring them back to Japan awesome. uh, over the Christmas. Yeah, Beautiful. Love that. Great. Bill, what about you? Uh, you know, I think, well, so people that know me know that I'm on the road a lot. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> I think uh, I think somewhere around December, like mid-December, I'm going to go skiing with uh, one of my you know, sons. And then I think somewhere around, uh, just around Christmas, I'm going to be on a on a a yacht in the Caribbean nice. for about a week, and then I'm probably going to be skiing. Entire like, family? Uh, yeah. yeah, they're right. all going to go with me. Yeah. Awesome. Yes. Nice. Yeah, because I and and what you'll find this out later too. Yeah. You can use Zoom over there. <laughs> yes, yes. They don't. You <laughs> yeah. don't have to pay for their flight if they zoom in. <laughs> That's true. It's just you. Yeah. Yeah, but eventually the kids end up in different schools, and then their their vacations are they don't yeah, like different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, and then so and they all have different. Uh, their th whatever they're interested in gets hardened yes. as they get older. Very so true. trying to get commonality, you you're in a good spot now because yeah, you yeah. can tell them what to do. Yeah, yeah. Okay. You know, but I think <laughs> they have a same schedule. Oh yeah. yeah. Not in high school yet. Exactly. Yeah, but eventually it's kind of like you know, gotta keep one busy here you gotta do something with everybody there and then it's there's tough. a lingering there there you know so i'll be doing a bunch of i'll, I'll have like four different vacations mm -hmm. in uh in december we sort of have like about 10 minutes left or 15 minutes and i guess wanted to just talk about how long this current wave of technology is going right now with with the uh forever the workplace forever. stuff and the, yeah. the data and yeah, what and if do you think there's a next wave well like uh and what is that i I believe in the power of technology, right? Yes. It, when it comes to data, you know, sometimes like, you know, pretty much like a Cambridge Analytica, like in use, right? Sometimes data is like, you know, told in n not really positive context. But at the end of the day, I strongly believe in the power of technologies and how the technologies can change the future of human beings and then this planet as well. I think, uh, you know, look at the technology, right? I think, uh, you know, every several years, uh, you have some new theme, right? You have the bigger data or maybe AR, maybe not as AI. And I think, uh, you know, that's the reason why, you know, the, the society can move forward because of uh, technology innovation, right? I think, uh, you know, I think uh, w this kind of uh, technology innovation will last forever, you know, from maybe biotech, you know, maybe life science, right? And uh, I think uh, together, like a lot of uh, technology innovation will come from the real demand from a society. Yeah. Yeah, and actually, so building on that, so I, I actually, I've been thinking about this a lot for a number of years because I'm working in this world of kind of distributed people, blockchain, you know, kind of the, quote, decentralized world. And what I've come to conclude, okay, so if you think about, I think we're basically, technology is allowing humans to go backwards 
in societal structure, but in a more productive way. So humans have been around for about 400,000 years. If you think about how people lived and worked for 99% of that, people were kind of, uh, they weren't centralized. They were agrarian, they were doing kind of whatever they did, and your job during the day changed a lot of times depending on what you wanted to do. Like you might have four friends that you picked berries with in the morning, and then five friends that you went hunting with. You know, So your job changed every minute of the day in a very flexible fabric. Yeah. It wasn't until about 150 years ago when the world went through the physical industrial revolution that there was concentration of capital and assets that changed work because suddenly you needed machinery that controlled marginal productivity. And so if you controlled capital and you controlled assets, you could become kind of like this robber baron. And it's only one or two generations before us where your parents and your parents were offered a job for life. And they expected to go to a big company and be in a skyscraper compartmentalized for their whole life but that didn't exist for 399,850 years. And now all of a sudden you have Zoom and you have data structures that allow all the individual economic productivity units that are people to abstract off the page, connect, and you have companies like the ones we've created with people all over the place that are economic machines not trapped in a building given a promise that will never be fulfilled of Job for life, retirement plan, that's all going away. You know, so I think what we're going to see now is life is going to become like this distributed spider web where everyone's a little atom on there, and you join or unjoin or rejoin different groups of people anytime you want. And think about, think about all of your kids, right? The next generation, none of them work on one job. Yep. Everybody we know has four or five things going on all the time. They are not married to a company. So the kinds of technologies right here are, are allowing humans to go back to humanity again. And the, li the life we've lived for 100 years was kind of fake. Mm -hmm. you know, yep. So that was the blip, and now we're going back. It's, it's, it's going to be really interesting. And the companies that are well positioned for that, that's, that's where you got to be. Mm -hmm. For those that are listening that have an idea for a company or maybe you're working on your own company for you bill what's your advice to them what do you see in people that feels like they got the stuff and what can those people work on yeah okay so i'm gonna i'm gonna not answer directly but kind of uh, espouse a philosophy mm -hmm. of what works okay so so i have spent my life remaking myself era after era these are short eras because of technology but you know i started in semiconductors funding things that moved electrons around. And then I started, uh, well, that industry is mature. I got to move up the stack. So then I started funding boxes that were made out of the chips. And then I started funding networks that were made out of the boxes. And then I started funding user interfaces on the networks and then the data science that determined whether you won or not, right? So it's always about the waves that are coming and then finding the right rider, right? So now everybody in the audience has probably tried to surf at least once. So if you think about surfing and investing and starting companies, they're almost exactly the same. I know that sounds weird, but they are almost exactly the same. You're basically looking at waves of things going across the world of the economy, and you can be in a couple positions. You can be behind the wave, you can be in front of the wave too far, or you can be on it. If you're behind it, trying to swim up the back and dropping in will never, ever happen. So you can't be too late. If you're too far in front, and you build up a big burn rate, you just paddle and paddle and paddle and you get really tired. <laughs> but if you are right at the right time and you drop in one stroke and you're up and it's like, oh, this is easy, right? So, so it's about applying your energy super efficiently at the right time of the market with the right rider. And the surfboard is the capital, Right, so it's kind of, I, I look for markets that are well-timed and I'm looking around, like I was looking for somebody like Kaz for three years before you walked him into my mm -hmm. office. You know, or, or like the video thing, I was like betting on Eric uh, Seton and you. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's kind of like, I feel it, I feel it, I feel it, the waves are there, I gotta find a writer. I gotta go out and find somebody that knows this space and then I hunt around and look for it and then I try to get other people. And the, the other thing I tell startups is, you have to put yourself in the vortex of information. Because right? you do not learn 
what the market needs until you're touching it and your people are telling you all oh, that that's kind of shitty <laughs> i need help no you know you need to fix like the color is not right you know just all those things unless you get that feedback you, you are totally inefficient because you take the money and you're like splatting products out there hoping someone will use it you know if, if you know exactly what people what problem you are solving every day you are very efficient with capital. We built this infrastructure company, Treasure Data, and only spent about 47? Uh, 44. $44 million for a frigging data infrastructure company <laughs> sucking down how many trillion rows of data a month? Yeah, I mean, like, at least a collection, collection rate, at least a 2 million rows a second. A second. So I, it's, wow. it's trillions a month, right? And because I look at all these other companies in data science and they spent 200 million, a billion, 500 million, 700 million. I would give the names, but that would be mean. You know, and so, you know we did it on $44 million and it worked, right? So it's kind of like you got to get, get the right wave, get the right people, surround the person with people that can give them feedback, get something in the market and learn and iterate. That's what it's about. We missed Peter. So Peter from uh, Wish was supposed to come join us, and we're going to take the show up to him <laughs> on the next Yeah, yeah. So we, 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 we want to yeah. interview the... Peter should have joined over Zoom. He should. Yeah, he yeah. should. Yeah. I should have. Yeah, well, the, this is... Uh, we're going into Cyber Monday and Black Friday. Oh, yeah. And those are the biggest revenue days of the entire year for that yeah, company. Yeah, he must sense. be very so busy. All very sudden, busy. Yeah, he sent me a note in a panic saying, Oh, my God. <laughs> you know, I, yeah. I don't think I can make it down today. Fully but, but, well, thanks, Eric, for thank you, Eric. the space and Later. Zoom. Thank you. Yeah. And, uh, you know, thank you guys for coming out. Awesome. Thank, thank you. you. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, yeah. everybody. Thank you.